Hey guys, and welcome to episode 130 of the OCDStories.com podcast. In this episode, I interviewed Dr. Jonathan Abramowitz, and John's been on the podcast before. Uh, it was a great first episode, at least I thought. He's, he's one of the people that, to me, just absolutely gets OCD, gets the inner workings of it, and more importantly, the inner workings of the therapeutic approach to treating it, which uh, the gold standard, as you know, is exposure and response prevention therapy, which is part of CBT. So I wanted to get him on again because I've since since the first episode, I've had time to read his book, which is Getting Over OCD. So I basically pull out some questions that I got when I was reading it for him. Uh, we discuss kind of the idea of a mini ritual and what that is. We talk about the openness scale, uh, which is how open are you to experiencing a thought um, the importance of tracking and monitoring compulsions or ritual uh, duration in recovery. Um, ask him the question that many people have, and he writes this in a book, which is, uh, I've tried ERP before and it doesn't work for me. Uh, and I get him to answer what he would say to someone if they said that. And it was a really fascinating answer. So if that's a question you have, hopefully that helps. Um, we talk about the importance of living a CBT lifestyle after after treatment, after therapy. Uh, and I think that was an interesting uh, take on kind of keep implementing CBT well beyond you're done uh, with with therapy. Uh, we talk about acceptance commitment therapy, enhancing exposure and response prevention therapy. And also um, John gives a couple of his favorite acts, which is acceptance commitment therapy metaphors. Uh, I love act metaphors. I think they really help. Uh, for me at least shape kind of a philosophy of, of understanding of ways of looking at thoughts and, and tackling OCD so hopefully you'll like those and there's a few listener questions questions that you asked uh, that I asked John and then obviously at the end the usual questions so yeah I hope you enjoy it and without further ado here is John. On today's show I have Dr. Jonathan Abramowitz. Jonathan is a clinical psychologist with a private practice in Chapel Hill, North Carolina specializing in the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder. He's also a professor of psychology and neuroscience at the University of North Carolina. John has written two self-help books and published over 250 scientific articles, books and books chapters. Uh, welcome to the podcast, John. Or welcome back, I should say. Thanks a lot. It's great to be back. And my, my voice is a lot better. I feel a lot better. So I'm ready for, ready for action. Excellent. And obviously, thank you for coming back and for doing that first episode where you know, your, your, what was it, tonsillitis or bronchitis? Or? I, probably tonsillitis or just yeah. a bad sore throat. I don't know what it was. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yes, yeah, so anyone listening, you'll be able to compare and contrast uh, John's two, two voices. Definitely. Go back and listen to that, to that January, um, was it January or February when you, we recorded it in January, I guess. Uh, yeah, we did, yeah. And in a way, I think... Um, you know, that episode in itself was a good example for recovery and for therapy because you probably didn't feel that that up to it. Your voice wasn't playing ball, but you continued on anyway towards I your goals that. and values. Yeah, I love that. That's exactly that's exactly right. We got to push through. That's exactly right. Cool. So um, your book, Getting Over OCD, um, is a br brilliant book. It's kind of now one of my favorites that I recommend. Uh, and I like it because you, you break down what's well, 10 steps for a start, but you really break down each, each, uh, each step. You, you give um, worksheets and tables people can fill out. Um, and what I really liked about it was at the start of each chapter, you kind of say, for the next two weeks, spend whatever it is, 45 minutes uh, a day reading this chapter, filling it in, uh, and then move on. And I like that. So you're almost guiding people through the book as opposed to here's a book, hope it works. Um, yeah, thanks. I, what I tried to do was kind of pour my heart and soul into writing it and to take what I do in my, in my practice when I'm working with people with OCD and, um, you know, as best you can put it into that self-help format. So I, you know, it was really, it was a labor of love. I, I spent a lot of time agonizing over, you know, what are the best words? How do I convey this point? That kind of stuff. It was fun. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so I guess my question was, um, how has it been received? Because it is different to other books in the sense of how structured it is. Yeah, you know, I get um, I get good feedback um, from people. I what's really gratifying is when people come into my office and they're holding a copy of it. They're like, "I bought your book." Um, 
So, you know, I, I, I hear nice things. Maybe people wouldn't say if they, if they didn't have nice things to say about it. But the feedback that I've gotten has been good, um, in particular that it's, that it's really thorough. Um, it, it's really difficult because OCD is so heterogeneous and it presents in so many different ways. It's really difficult to write a book, a self-help book especially, that addresses all the different types of, of OCD. And so when somebody comes to me and they say, hey, you know, that example of, you know, Freddie on page 270, that's exactly me. Um, that makes me feel really good that I, you know, I did a good job of, you know, trying to address all those different permutations. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, there's a very tough, tough task. Um, I think you do it in a way that is quite, because I know when people read some of these books, sometimes I remember for me being very anxious, looking for, for my symptoms, my exact obsessions, and then if they're not there, you get disheartened, etc. Uh, yeah. And I think you do a good job of kind of navigating around that kind of minefield. Um, Thanks a lot. It's nice of you to say. It's good yeah, to hear. No worries. And there's a few more things I'll pull out in, in the next few questions around the book that, that, that I hadn't really come across before. Um, towards the start of the book, you, you talk about... Um, you, well, you, I've got a quote here, you put, I hope you'll find this book has everything science and art has to offer. And, you know, and I guess some people would see uh, therapy as a science, some people would see it as an art, and here you're saying it's both. I guess, why is that? I think it's both. And the reason is that, you know, we, we have this treatment, exposure and response prevention, and we understand we understand that it works really well. We've tested it out for decades, you know, 50, 60 years now. Mm. Um, and we know we have some good ideas of how it works to extinguish fear and, and things like that. And that's the science of it. The art, however, is that everyone who, who comes into the office, you know, with OCD, with obsessions and compulsions, everybody's a little bit different. And so in order to optimize exposure therapy, in order to implement ERP in, in, in a way that, that each particular person needs, that requires creativity, that requires having you know, a really good understanding and a good feel for what OCD is and, and being able to anticipate you know, what that person needs. And, 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 and I, I think that that's an art. I don't think science has gotten to the point where we can really you know, ask those kinds of really specific you know, patient by patient questions. I think we need to use our our intuition to to some extent, and so I really think it's a it's a combination of of both. Yeah, yeah, really good way of looking at it. And um, there was this thing that came up uh, called a mini ritual in your book that when I read it, I was like, ah, I completely see that, um, <laughs> but I'd never heard that term before. So I guess it'd be good if you explain what is a mini ritual. Sure. So, you know, sometimes um, I'm working with someone with OCD who has this extensive, you know, hand washing rituals. They'll wash their hands for, let's say, you know, five minutes at a time. They have to go up to their elbows, things like that. And we're, we're doing exposure therapy and, and they, they come in at some point and they say, well, I've, I've shortened the rituals down where I only have to just kind of wipe my hands on my shirt. And, 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 and then I'm good to go. So instead of taking five minutes, it takes five seconds. And, and look, you know, this, this is great. But from my perspective, it's not great because the idea, the function of that behavior is still to clean off germs that you don't need to clean off. And so the person has taken a big, you know, lengthy ritual and they've made it into, I guess my term is a, a mini ritual. It's kind of, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's barely noticeable. The person can do it very easily. Um, you know, and, and so it's, it's very covert, mm. but at the end of the day, it's still a ritual and we still need to address that. It still prevents the person from learning that you don't have to do any of that kind of cleaning, that you're safe, you know, no matter what you do. Uh, so I call those, those mini rituals, I call them out so that people who read my book will understand it's not about how long the ritual takes. It, it's about what's the purpose of it. If you're doing anything to make yourself feel safe, in an obsessional situation, then that is a ritual and it's just, just as important if it takes you a long time or a short time or if it's a whole involved thing or if it's just something very subtle. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah I guess that's really important because 
the, the, the stereotypical view of OCD uh, is that it's, it's on the duration. You know, I'm, I've been in the shower for a couple hours. I've been washing my hands. I've been driving back and forth for the last day, whatever it is. Um, but like you said, it's anything that lowers that anxiety or attempts to lower it. Yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, one of the things that I, I, I agree that it's a mistake that a lot of people make is that they think that OCD is, is worse based on how much time do your rituals take. And so if I can just get my rituals to take a shorter amount of time, that means I'm getting better. Mm. I don't look at it that way um, because what's still happening, even if your rituals are taking a shorter amount of time, you're still doing the rituals. And what's the purpose of rituals? It's to escape from obsessional anxiety, from, from, you know, from a fear that isn't really you know, um, uh, an objective danger in the first place. So anything that you do is still bad news. It still keeps the OCD engine going. And in therapy, a good cognitive behavior therapist, a good exposure therapist is going to want you to eliminate all of those rituals, even the really small ones. Absolutely. I guess it's kind of like the slippery slope. Like you may have got the big ones out of the way, but if you're doing these little ones, that could easily, yeah, take your legs out. Exactly. You got it. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, so, uh, you also talk about the openness scale in your book. Yes. Now this, this is a, uh, not, not in this wording, but it, it's come up before a couple of times, I think earlier on in the podcast. Um, and I see the importance of it for, for recovery, but it'd be good if you could explain kind of what it is and, and why it's important. Sure. So, um, I guess to, to directly answer your question, the openness scale is this idea of measuring how, uh, how willing are you to experience anxiety, to experience obsessional thoughts, uncertainty, guilt, disgust, whatever those emotions that are linked to OCD, how, how open, how willing are you to experience those when they show up? Because they do, and they do for everybody, whether or not you have OCD. Mm -hmm. Now, traditionally in, in exposure therapy, We've been focused on trying to get anxiety to come down. So we keep track with subjective units of distress like suds. And we think about habituation. And we think about how very often, you know, um, exposure is successful when I have habituation, when my anxiety level goes, goes down. That's how I know that the exposure is over. That's how I know that I'm finished. And maybe we can talk more about this later on, but research is actually showing that that's not a very good indicator of long-term outcome. Lots of people have habituation, but then they don't get better. And then actually people get better sometimes without having habituation. And so what we're thinking about now in exposure therapy, and this draws on ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, this draws on just new ways of thinking about exposure called inhibitory learning, what we're focusing on now is helping um, people, instead of to try to bring their anxiety down, helping them to be open to their anxiety, helping them to learn that anxiety is safe, anxiety is tolerable, obsessional thoughts are safe, they're tolerable, all of those kind of inner OCD experiences, those things that we, we all know, we experience them inside of ourselves, and if you have OCD, often those seem very scary, we want to do exposure to teach people how to be open to those things, how to tolerate them, how to learn that you can go about your day, do the things that are important to you, whether it's school, work, relationships, leisure time, even though anxiety shows up, thoughts show up, things like that. And so in my book, I focus um, a lot on uh, trying to increase openness, increase willingness to tolerate, to have those experiences rather than worrying about habituation. Habituation is good, and it happens. It usually happens naturally, but we want to take a step further and, and focus on even if habituation doesn't happen, I'm still okay. Um, we don't want habituation to be, I guess, to, to become the factor that determines whether or not you're successful. I, I want readers of my book to understand that they're successful when they learn that anxiety is okay, obsessional thoughts are okay, and, and become open to that. Yeah, that's a very good point, and it's great to see you, who's at the forefront of, of you know traditional ERP and uh, exposure work, 
is, is now also considering and accepting these other ideas from things like ACT and integrating it in. I, yeah, yeah, because I think that they, they do go side by side. And like you said, some people take longer to habituate, some may not habituate as easily. But That's it's, right. yeah, and, I, and maybe this is a, a political, philosophical question, but do you feel society, the way it's, it's kind of, at least Western society, the way we've been taught to look at emotions generally, um, you know, happiness is good, we should be putting all our energy into finding it getting everything else is bad, right. is making things like this willingness to accept anxiety more difficult than it needs to be? Absolutely. I, I think we have been trained as human beings to evaluate our emotions and to evaluate our private subjective experiences as good or bad. This is a good thought. This is a bad thought. I should be feeling this way. I shouldn't be feeling this way. And um, that's not the case. Our experiences, our, our own thoughts, our own feelings, and, and just our private experiences, they're, they're experiences that we all have. They're neither good nor bad. They're just experiences. And um, yeah, we, uh, in our society, we, we certainly um, put value judgments on, on some of those. And, and I don't think that's a good idea. I think that's one of the things that leads to uh, developing problems like OCD and anxiety and panic and things like that, or, or that it, it can lead to that. Yeah, absolutely. Really good point. I always kind of say to people that you often hear people say, oh, I can't do X, Y, and Z because I'm anxious. And it's like, yeah. well, is, is anxiety stopping your legs from moving? No, it's not. It's just making exactly. you very uncomfortable. Now, what does stop your legs from moving in, in a uh, kind of rhetorical sense is, is doing things to fight anxiety, like in OCD, like doing rituals. Hmm. When, when we do rituals, that's what gets in the way of people's lives. Um, it's, as, as you said, it's not the anxiety. It's not the thoughts. You can still move your, your body with thoughts and, and anxiety. But if you're caught, you know, in the bathroom washing for 50 minutes or if you're caught changing your clothes or if you're, you know, asking for reassurance over and over again, that's what's going to get in the way of, of functioning. And, and when I see patients, it's the rituals, it's the things that they're doing to try to fight their anxiety and fight their thoughts. That's what gets that's what mucks up their life, not the thoughts themselves, because Everyone has anxiety and everyone has intrusive thoughts and everyone feels guilty and uncertain uh, once in a while. I tell my patients that I live with all those things every day, but th those things don't have to stop you. It's when you try to fight. It's when you try to you know, reduce that. And so exposure therapy in line with all of that, I think we're moving toward an exposure therapy where we're learning, we're using exposure to learn that anxiety is safe and tolerable rather than learning to make it go away. Yeah, re yeah, really good point. And I, I, I've heard quite a few people over the last year, um, and this could just be m me me noticing it more because ACT's been more on my mind. Um, and that that when I they don't actually say like this, but how I interpret it as things really changed for them when a when they were doing ARP, but it it really improved more than that when they they took ACT principles and applied it into the ERP because for me and how I interpreted that is um, ACT is like the, the philosophic, philosophical framework and ERP is the tools and is that, is that fair to say because I think ACT sometimes uh, ERP sorry the main philosophical framework is face your fear which right. <laughs> is extremely hard for most people but yeah. then if you have this other framework use the face your fear tools but you have the ACT framework of um, it's okay to feel this way. I'm going to feel it and just live according to my values anyway. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's exactly right. And that's what, um, so I, I've been working with uh, Michael Tuhig on some research to, you know, how can we um, infuse ACT into exposure? How, what does that look like? And we, we just actually finished, um, and the paper just got accepted actually in behavior research and therapy. Um, how, you know, how can we integrate that? So we, we've got a program, we've got a, a manual for, for doing that now. Um, but, and I've started to do that in my, in my practice as well. I, I think it's, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to, uh, you know, I, well, exposure, I think is the greatest form of acceptance because here you have the person basically saying, bring it on, bring on that fear. I can do this. I can, I can have this, um, 
So I, yeah, I completely agree. Sure. No, thank you. And yeah, I agree that that, yeah, that willingness to say, well, if my fear is true, then so be it, but I'm going to do this anyway. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the things that people with OCD worry about typically are, are not true, right? It's, it's oh, yeah. just that it's that uncertainty. You don't have a guarantee. Yeah. Uh, so, we, but we got to press on because we all press on without guarantees. I'm gonna I'm gonna drive home at the end of the day and hope I make it home, but I don't have a guarantee. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, okay, so uh, I uh, we're gonna come back to to act a bit later. Um, uh, so. Is, uh, is it important, and if so, why is it important to monitor and track um, compulsion or ritual duration in, in recovery? Yeah, great, great question. Um, we know from research on, um, you know, how, how people can stop behavioral habits that one of the best predictors of being able to stop a habit is to keep track of it. And so I think there are three important reasons that uh, we want to track rituals and kind of self-monitor rituals um, during ERP. One is that it, it gives you an opportunity to kind of look at and see when those rituals are, are happening, take stock in that and recognize, oh boy, I didn't realize that it was, you know, this many minutes or hours a day or that it was happening this many times. And so, you know, that just helps you kind of become aware of it and that can help you to reduce the, the behavior. The second thing is that it gives you an idea of, kind of like a before and, and after picture. It helps you to see how you're improving. Um, we often see on, on TV those, you know, weight loss commercials. Here is, you know, uh, the, the person, you know, 30 days ago, and here they are now, and they've lost you know, 300 pounds in 30 days. Here's how they look in a bathing suit. Um, obviously, it's a little bit different, but yeah. with CD, we can kind of take a before and after picture. Here's how many rituals you're doing on day one. And then on day, you know, 30, here's how many rituals you're down to. So it, it helps people. It helps to reinforce them to, to continue to work harder. And I think the third reason that I ask people to do that is it helps them to kind of say, well, gee, I don't want to have to write this down. So maybe I can get away with not doing it. So it's an intervention in itself um, that helps people to kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, um, sometimes resist. Like, gee, this is motivation. If I can just get through like a half hour with trying, kind of riding the wave of this ritual and not giving in, then maybe I don't even have to write it down. Or maybe I can get away without doing it. So that's why I think that's important. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And um, yeah, it's interesting to hear it explained like that. So um, you, you wrote, I can't remember if this was a chapter or just a, a quite a big subheading, but you wrote, I've tried ERP before, it doesn't work for me which I'm guessing is a common complaint you've had or query uh, or you've heard around the internet. Uh, so I guess if, if someone did come to you and they said that, kind of what would your answer be? Well, the first thing I would want to know would be uh, about the, the ERP. What exactly did they, did they do? Um, a lot of people think that they're doing ERP, but they're really not. So when, I, when people come to me and I ask them, tell me about the ERP that you've done, Sometimes they say that they did exposure, but they didn't do response prevention, which is no good because you know, why do the exposure if you're not going to stop the, the rituals, right? Yeah. Sometimes they've done exposure, but they haven't really taken it all the way home. So they just did the, the easy exposures. Well, then that's not really going to be of much help. It might temporarily reduce some of the OCD, but eventually things are going to come back because you never really learned that you know, even the worst fears that you have are still generally safe. Um, and then some people say, you know, I've, I try ERP in my life all the time. I, you know, I'm, I, I always touch the, the floor if I drop money or I do this. And when you really ask people about that, it turns out what they're doing is when, when they do the ERP, they're still kind of resisting whatever it is they're doing. They're trying to fight the anxiety, which is kind of like, like ritualizing, right? Rituals are about fighting anxiety. When, when we do good ERP, it's about really leaning into it. It's about really saying, bring it on. And so often when people say, I've done ERP, but it hasn't worked, what I find from asking them carefully is that they haven't really taken on the spirit of bring it on, lean into it, openness. They've kind of been doing it kind of in a half-assed way. And, and kind of resisting uh, the, the anxiety. And, and 
uh, that's, you know, I, I, I hope that readers will do it differently when they read my book or go to see a good therapist. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you, you know, I think that was quite near the end of the book. So hopefully if they've got to that point that they won't have that. Yeah. That question. I think, I think it's in the section when I'm talking about like, like exposure in general, because a lot of people, you're right. A lot of people are afraid of it. It's, it's not a fun thing to do. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people say, I've done this before, this doesn't work, I need something different. Um, but really, in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, you really haven't done it. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. And there's, yeah, and it could, it could just be one thing that's slightly off that needs to be tweaked. Maybe it hasn't right. been tailored in the right way. Maybe you've gone in too deep, um, too early, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and maybe you need to infuse act. <laughs> Or uh, mindfulness or something else. Or... Yeah, that's right. Cool. All right. So um, I really like this point about you make a point towards the end about saying uh, you, na- you now, after therapy, need to live the CBT lifestyle. So I guess what is this and why is it important? Yeah. So it's just like if a person goes on, on a diet, they want to lose weight. Um, and it's actually one of the reasons that diets don't work too well is that you know, you go on a diet, you're on, you're on the diet for, you know, uh, a month or something like that. And then you're off the diet. And so you go back to eating all the unhealthy stuff that you were eating before. And then you gain the weight back. And lots of people who go on diets, they do what we call yo-yoing. They lose weight and they gain weight and they lose weight and they gain weight. Instead, if you want to lose weight and keep it off, you have to change the lifestyle. It's not just about You're on a diet, you're off a diet, but it's more about making gradual changes and doing, making changes that you can stick with over the long haul. And and that's what helps you to, you know, continue to to stay healthy when, if we're talking about like losing weight, if we're talking about OCD, it means just because you finished your 12 weeks or 20 weeks of exposure therapy, you got to continue to do exposure. You, You don't just stop and say, okay, I'm done. I can, you know, go back to hand washing or, or go back to avoiding stuff more likely. Instead, you want to continue to, to do exposure, to continue to avoid avoidance, um, to continue to, to, you know, reduce rituals and, and think about it as this is how I'm going to live the rest of my life. I, when I have the opportunity to confront something rather than avoid it, that's related to what my OCD is about or what obsessional thoughts are about. I'm going to confront it rather than avoid it. When I have the opportunity to do a ritual versus not do a ritual, I'm going to decide that I'm better off not doing a ritual. And in order for long-term maintenance, that has to be the person's lifestyle. And that person will always have to think a little bit harder about exposure and response prevention than, let's say, a person who never had OCD. They will probably, because that, that pattern's been there, they'll probably always need to Think twice about about that. Um, less and less as they go by, if they continue to engage in that in that kind of a, you know exposure and CBT lifestyle, but they'll, they'll probably still need to continue in in some respect for a long time. Mm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I agree with what you just said there. It's, you, it's people with OCD or any kind of anxiety disorder ha- will have to be more cautious than someone who isn't. And um, there's, there's a thing in ACT, as, as you'll be well aware of, called the choice point, which is yeah. in any given moment you have a choice, you're either moving towards what you want or away from it. And I, I always use that. Whenever I start to feel that, like this morning, um, as I was walking out my flat, uh, I was like, oh, have I switched the, the main socket off? Uh, where usually where I have the iron. And and I was like, okay, I was about to go back and look. And I thought, well, I mean, if I do that, there's a good chance I'm, I'm starting on that slippery slope again. And that yeah. using that choice point helped me kind of make those those choices. That's exactly right. And, and even, you know, so I, I mean, I, I've, I've never had OCD, but I get that. I have that same experience. I can't tell you how many times I've pulled away. I have a garage Mm. and I can't tell you how many times I've pulled away from my garage. And in the summer, the trees are in bloom. And even if I look over my shoulder, I can't see for sure if I've, if I've put it down, if I hit the button in my car to put the garage door down, I've had that urge. Like 
oh, I really want to go back and check. And being someone like me who knows about all this stuff pretty well, I'm like, nope, just keep driving, John. Yeah. And um, but every, I think that's something that everybody uh, you know has to experience, whether you've had OCD or not. We all have these kinds of intrusive thoughts. We all have these urges sometimes. And it's better to lean into the uncertainty, you know, just as you were saying. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. Um, so, so uh, on the ACT theme again, um, ACT, ACT therapists and people who use ACT uh, are very famous for using metaphors. It's, it's a real underpinning of ACT. Uh, and I know you put quite a few in the book, but I guess there are a couple of your favorites that you feel linked to ERP that would help someone in their ERP. Oh boy, I love, I, I mean, that's, that's what I really like about ACT. The, the metaphors are awesome because they, they just kind of help you think about OCD, first of all, just the problem of OCD. They help you think about exposure and, and how you're supposed to use it. And oh man, I mean, I could go on for days about these things. I guess my favorite, oh, my favorite is probably the, the digging metaphor. Um, and, uh, you know, this is where the, the person ends up in a ditch and all they have is a shovel. And so they start to, to try to dig their way out of the ditch. And of course, you can't do that. When you dig in a ditch, the ditch gets bigger and bigger. And that's analogous to doing rituals where and, and avoidance where in OCD, you know, you've got anxiety, you've got intrusive thoughts. OK, that's one thing. But the more you do rituals and the more you avoid, you just kind of make them bigger and bigger. You, the space that OCD takes up is bigger and bigger, just like that ditch. Um, and, and the person doesn't realize that there's nothing bad about being in a ditch. You're, you know, and, and everybody has a ditch that they're in. And so you know, the thing to do is to be able to put down the shovel and to realize, you know what, I, I can be in this ditch. It's, it's okay to be in the ditch. Um, I don't have to keep digging. And in fact, the more I dig, the worse things get. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'd like to say to, to my own patients and clients is, you know, if, if you were to, in the way that things are going now for you, if, you know, if, if I had a golden shovel, right, it's what, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for me to give you a golden shovel to dig your way out. But that even a golden shovel is not going to help you get out of the ditch. That's not what you need. Um, you, you need, you know, you need to learn to put down the shovel. And uh, I think that helps people really understand. Sometimes I'll even say, even if I had a ladder and I gave it to you, you'd probably try to dig with it because that's all you know to do is to try to dig your way out of this ditch. Digging doesn't work. Um, and, and we can come back to that later in, in therapy where if the person is, you know, doing rituals, even if it's like at one of these mini rituals, I'll say, hey, that still sounds like digging to me. And, and so I think what the whole idea of digging does is it gets away from this idea that, you know, some rituals are longer than others. Some rituals are more uh, overt. Some are more covert. If it's digging, it's digging. If it's a ritual, it's, it's about trying to get out of the ditch. And we want to put all, we want to put down all the shovels and, and just kind of live in the ditch um, and see that it's OK to be in the ditch. Long winded explanation. But that I think that is my favorite for kind of getting people to a place where they understand, hey, this is the problem that I'm in. And, and then um, I guess if I can go on, I have a, a favorite when it I comes to. Yeah. When it comes to doing exposure, actually doing exposure. I love the one about the tug of war with a monster. Um, because here people are, um, you know, so you're on one side of a cliff and the monster's on the other side of the cliff and there's the river in between and you're playing tug of war and whoever loses this tug of war is going over, over the cliff into the river and, and it's history. And of course you don't want to lose. And most people think there are only two outcomes here, either I win or the, or the big monster who's a lot stronger than I am, or, or you know, he wins. And what I want people to see is that, yeah, you have options. You can put down the, put down the rope, right? You can, you can not engage in, in the tug of war. And if you do that, the monster is still going to be on his side of the cliff, yelling and beating his chest and taunting you. And that's what exposure is about. Bring it on. I can hear you yelling. Yeah. I, can, I can listen to you. I can see you. Yeah, you're bigger than me. You're ugly. You're scary looking. But you can't hurt me because you're on the other side of the cliff. And, and I am not going to try to pull. I'm not going to engage you in this fight. I'm going to, 
I'm going to put down the rope and I haven't beaten you, but you can't beat me. And I think that's where, that's where we want people with OCD to go um, in their mind, seeing it as it's not about beating the obsessions. It's, a, it's about being able to have them there, being able to be in contact with them, to see them, to hear them, but you don't have to fight them. And that, I think, sets up exposure therapy so well. It's just, it's a, it's a nice, eloquent way, and, and it helps, helps patients. I find, anyway, my, you know, in my practice, it helps patients really understand what we're doing, where we're going with this. Yeah. And is that, yeah, really good. I like that one. And it's kind of, I guess, I don't want to say easier, but I will. It might make ERP slightly easier in the sense of they're going in with this framework of this is scary, but it's not going to kill me. Yeah. Or is that, is it? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you can write on. And I mean, all of these things, like the, the jerk who comes to the party, are you going to let him in the party, right? I, I can still enjoy myself if the, even if this jerk is at the party. I don't have to love everyone at my party. Yeah. Or um, the, uh, the passengers on the bus, right? I don't have to like all the passengers that are on my bus. And I can listen to them saying nasty stuff. I don't have to tell them. I don't have to fight them to get off. I can still go where I want to go. And, the, oh, the chessboard. Right where you're the board and you're in contact with all the pieces, the the pieces you like and the pieces you don't like. You're you're in touch with those, but you don't try to manipulate them. These are beautiful metaphors, I, and that's that's really what I like most about about ACT is that they they've given us such a great way to talk about exposure therapy better than your sons are going to go up and your sons are going to come down. You know all this yeah. kind of stuff. And, um, it's 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 a little less technical, a little more touchy feely, and um, I, I think that it really helps to get people on board and, and yeah, I'm not sure if it makes it easier, but it makes, it gives them a better understanding of what they're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it, yeah, you're right. E easy is not the right one, but it kind of, for me, it's kind of, you feel less in the dark when you're doing it because I don't know if that makes sense. Like I feel with yeah, ERP is maybe the science and uh, act as the art because yeah. e ERP is that, as you said, your, your spike and over time you'll habituate, you'll go down, etc. But that that's quite dark, as in quite scary. It's, yeah, whereas act, those metaphors give you a way of, it gives you a vision, something to see and hold on to. Totally, absolutely. Right on. Cool. All right, so, um, yeah, thanks for that. They're all really good. So I guess, is there anything else? You mentioned quite a bit earlier about exposure with like, um, inhibitory learning, et cetera. Um, is there anything else you wanted to go in more detail in that or anything else you wanted to share? I mean, just, you know, in inhibitory learning is this new way of thinking about exposure. Uh, the basic idea is that when we do exposure, we don't erase the fear. But this is what we've learned from research on memory and, and how we learn. We don't erase fear from our mind, from our brain. Um, instead, when we do exposure and, and, you know, we learn something, that new learning competes with the old fear. So they're, they're both there simultaneously, kind of, you know, if you will, battling it out metaphorically. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is help the person to learn the new safety learning in a way that is going to, um, I guess, block the old fear learning. And or in, in technically what we say is the new, the new safety learning inhibits the older fear learning. And that's really what inhibitory learning is about. And so this, this has implications for how we do exposure therapy in ways that are going to really solidify this learning over the, over the long term. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I've incorporated those in, into the book, just different ways of making sure you do exposure in all different settings, making sure you vary up the exposure, combine different fear cues together. Um, focus on, you know, having a prediction. If I don't wash my hands, I will get sick in three days and, and testing that prediction out and really paying attention to that. So I've, I've incorporated that into the book again, to kind of stay current with the latest uh, science and, and art of exposure therapy. It's cool stuff. I, I I'm, I'm a nerd about all this stuff. <laughs> I love this. It's, it's good. <laughs> and it's uh, it's good for your patients. Um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And also anyone who reads the book. So, um, okay, so, uh, so I've got like a million things going through my head. You ever get that way, you just lose your train of thought. So, uh, a couple listener question, uh, questions. Um, this one, which is, 
quite common is uh, how do you do ERP for backdoor spikes? For example, fear that you don't actually have OCD. Yeah, that's that's a tough one, and I, I see that sometimes in in my practice. Um, I, I think it gets back to learning how to live with uncertainty. Th there is no objective test for OCD. You can't do like a uh, a blood test for OCD, and so you know um, there's no way to definitively know uh, if it's OCD that you have, or if your fear is real, or if you've got, you know, some people worry, what if it's schizophrenia instead of OCD, or what if I'm really a pedophile instead of having OCD? Um, the exposures that, that I, I would help someone do for that is, you know, probably imaginal exposure to the uncertainty of not knowing for sure, mm -hmm. and helping the person to, I guess, put down the shovel when it comes to digging and trying to find out what, you know, what it is that you really have, and instead, um, focusing on being able to live your life and doing the things that are important to you, you know, according to your values, even though you don't have that guarantee. So it's, it's less about, you know, what you have and, and more about, you know, how can I learn how to operate even though I don't know for sure what, what I have? How can I, you know, how can I be as productive as I need to be in life and do the things that I value in my life, even though I cannot get that guarantee. I would, I would argue that no one who has a diagnosis of OCD has a guarantee 100% that that is what they have. Um, cause not, not because we're not good enough at diagnosing it, but because that is impossible to know 100% for sure. Um, similarly, you know, I, so I consider myself a, a, a physically healthy person right now because I don't have any, you know, symptoms, but it, I, I might have, you know, cancer that I just haven't detected yet and, or a heart disease that no one's detected yet. And um, I just have to, you know, I, I could go to the doctor every day and start my day by having a diagnostic test, but that's just not really practical. So we have to live with that reasonable amount of uncertainty. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you've just triggered about 5,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's a, it's a, in vivo exposure. Um, <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay. So similar question to the one I just asked you, which was, and this was actually from a former guest who we kind of debated it on the show and she wasn't sure, uh, but she okay. basically said, when can I tell myself it's OCD or should I always live with the uncertainty? So I think what she, from memory, what she meant by this was she knows that if she tells herself it's OCD, that could be considered a compulsion. Um, but she's saying, does that mean I should never say it's OCD even if I'm not anxious? Should I always just say, maybe I do, maybe I don't? Wow, so first of all, I thought we agreed you were only gonna ask me easy questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding you. Um, it, that's a tough one. And, and I think I have a couple of different thoughts about it. One is that it might vary from person to person. Some people might be able to get away with kind of saying, okay, this is, this is just my OCD talking and, and, I'm, and I'm fine. Um, other people whose rituals involve, you know, that need for certainty and, and getting a guarantee, they're probably, it's going to be more important for them to be able to learn um, that I can't know for sure and, and that maybe it is, maybe it isn't my OCD. Mm. And, and if you wanted to think about like what's the happy medium there, probably something like, you know, it seems like this is my OCD, but I can never really be sure is, is probably what I would suggest people uh, to, to go for, you know, eh, it seems like one of those OCD things, but I, I can never have that guarantee. And then you kind of cover all bases. Yeah, really good points. It's kind of, it's probably OCD, but maybe it isn't. Yeah, <laughs> that kind exactly. Of exactly. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I think like in 95% in of people's lives, we, we, we all, we don't even think about these kinds of things, right? Um, probably there's no asbestos in my office, but there could be, yeah. right? This building is built in the 1950s. Um, probably I'm going to get home safely, but I could get killed in a car accident. Um, and so most people, even people with OCD, they're pretty good with uncertainty in like 95% of their lives. It's where the, the obsessions strike. That's where they have to really learn how to... Um, you know, use the same tactics that they use in other areas and apply those to, to obsessions. Yeah, yeah, really good point. Um, okay, so 
if you met someone with OCD, obviously you do all the time, but let's just say yeah. someone came up to you at the OCD conference and they asked for just one bit of advice. That's all you could give them. Uh, and you're never going to see them again, other than kind of go see a therapist. Uh, what right. would that one bit of advice be? I think it would be lean into uncertainty and, and recognize that uncertainty is ubiquitous and it's always going to be there and you can manage it. So, yeah, you can manage uncertainty um, and all of those kind of private experience. You can manage uncertainty, you can manage intrusive thoughts, you can manage anxiety. That's probably what I would want people to say. If I could sum up all of OCD treatment in like, you know, a sentence or two, that's what it would be. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Okay, so if you could pick up the phone and call your 20-year-old self, what would you tell <laughs> that young man? Oh, I would tell them a lot of things what not to do. Um, <laughs> I would probably tell them that the stuff that you're worried about, and back then it was more like, you know, social stuff, and do people like me, and, you know, do I have the right clothes, that that stuff doesn't matter one, one bit. Um <laughs> Not, do I, I don't know if this relates to OCD or not, but um, yeah, I would, I would, that's probably what I would tell myself. I, I, I was kind of, uh, uh, when, when I was 20, I was, I was, I still had an immaturity streak um, and doing some things that I probably, you know, shouldn't have been doing and not caring about stuff. Um, I didn't care a lot about, you know, history and literature and stuff like that, that I really appreciate now, but, but I missed my, Missed my chance in college to like really pay attention and, and enjoy those classes. I, I was more waiting to go out onto the baseball field or the basketball court, um, you know. But now I would probably, I'd probably go back and be a better student. <laughs> I, I, I turned out okay, but at twenty it was a little touch and go. Right. <laughs> I'm sure it's like that for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's good advice. Um, <laughs> and is there anything else you you want to share that you wish I had asked you? Boy, we covered a lot of ground. Um, so no, I you know what what you do. I, you know, I've had a chance since the, the last podcast I was on. I've listened to some of your other ones, and I think it's just fantastic. Uh, you know what what, what you're doing. Um, so it's very impressive, and I'm just you know really pleased to uh, to be part of it. And um, yeah, I, I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate it. It means a lot, and uh, I'm honoured that you obviously come on because the podcast is what it is because of the guests. So. Thanks. Thank you. So there you have it. I hope you enjoy my chat with John. And quick disclaimer, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care, guys.